sure you'll introduce yourself and yeah. we'll learn about this. <laughs> Yeah, it's relatively easy. So my name is Michał Bielicki and I'm like responsible for the community work in Lizard FS. Yeah. More volume. Does this work at all? Ah, okay. Cool. I was wondering at the speaker before already that no audio. So my name is Michał Bielicki and I'm basically managing the community activities of Lizard FS. Right. Um, we are a, a Polish project, and I'm today not introducing it. I think it's on. Yeah, but, but so. So today I'm not in introducing Lizard FS, but I'm, I want to uh, tell you about what we did in the last 12 months, right? So if somebody doesn't uh, know our project, we have a booth in, in Building K, plus there are like people around here and running around the show with Lizard FS t-shirts that can explain you every detail possible, like one is sitting there, he actually wrote quite a lot of the stuff I will be talking about, so we have every answer available uh, you could imagine. Right. Um, last, year was <laughs> last year was very important for us because we introduced many new features. We are a relatively small community, so uh, being able to introduce all that in one year was was quite a job. So we introduced uh, NFS uh, support via Ganesha. We introduced a new, uh, a new ACL support. We have full support of rich ACL. Um, I will talk about that later more. We introduced a new task engine. We introduced support for HDFS emulation. And we introduced a new C client library that allows you to write your own desert FS clients. Um, we, we also started supporting read ahead caching. We had some problems with sequential writes and performance, and uh, that also vanished in the last year. We introduced support for massive recursive remove jobs. We created a whole new documentation, so uh, at least most of the administration and installation features are pretty well documented. And we started supporting two new platforms, FreeBSD and Fedora. The FreeBSD one is still in the queue with the FreeBSD people. The port is published, but it takes its time in the FreeBSD community. Right? Um, we also did uh, some changes. We have a, a Windows client, but we have extended the Windows support so that you can probably compile all of Lizard FS now in the new Linux subsystem on Windows. Um, it makes no difference if you like the platform or not, but uh, one of the, the things we believe in is the more platforms you support, the more easy it is to find bugs. Right, every compiler compiles differently. Every platform uh, shows you different bugs. For bug squelching, this is like the easiest way to have to see things that you wouldn't see if you just do it on one distro, one platform, one operating system. Um, and we added some some smaller changes, like um, people were complaining that you basically can have the situation where you have. Uh, chunk servers running on the same IP address but on different ports and your replication would be <laughs> basically on the same machine. Right. So we added uh, a feature to recognize that. Um, our system now recognizes how much load which chunk server has and tries to, adv uh, to adjust its writes to, to, to write to the lowest 
to, to, the, to the least loaded tank server. Um, we now have minimal goal configurations. We finally changed to a semantic versioning system, which was a bit confusing before, even for me. Uh, and we, we, we did a lot of small uh, fixes that still, uh, to clean out still uh, coding mistakes that come from the project where we forked off four years ago. We have a lot, we have a lot of places where, where small, where, where small ports were not understandable in the code and we seem to have reached the point where 90% of that is gone. Um, we now have caching for faster directory lookups. There's, there are new whole path lookup functions. Um, if you want details on any of the, of the more developer-like features, our main developer is sitting in this room and can answer any, of any question you may have. Um, we scratched quite some bugs. We had uh, we had a lot of uh, places where where things were still set up for low for low speed networks and for low speed disks uh, and not prepared for the new more performance hardware environments. Right? We fixed most of that. There is uh, we had some problems with global locking, especially people that were using the Windows client had problems with that. We fixed that. Um, we now <laughs> support ARM officially. I mean, before it was very theoretically. Now we support it. There are still there are still probably not all problems with ARM fixed because we don't have enough hardware for that, and are waiting for some some promised hardware from people that want to use the ARM platform. But it seems to work because I know at least two customers that run. Uh, that run their lizard clusters on ARM. Um, we, we also fixed some, some problems that we had with the mathematical library that we use, libjd, that seems to be unsupported everywhere. So we had to implement some ways around the bugs. I think the Ubuntu one is totally borked. Um, I, and I'm not sure if you found all the problems with it, <laughs> but it seems that most of them are gone. Um, finding defective files was a bit complicated still last year. That's fixed as well. And request sizes in read cache have been fixed as well. They, they were uh, often reported in zero size, which was just wrong. Go on. Okay, so last year we, we introduced uh, ACL support. Um, the, A support uh, the, AC the ACL support, th the way the ACL support is presented depends on which platform your client is using, right? Because your client has to, to uh, be able to present it. The, the backend system uses rich ACL, which is a superset of the NFS ACL, uh, the, the NFS ACLs. And we try to, to translate to, in every client, to the one that that client is supporting. Um, the only platform where we are not able, for the only platform of the supported platforms where we are not able to do any translation or any ACL support is FreeBSD because the Fuse library that we have to use there doesn't support ACLs. So for now, no ACLs for FreeBSD clients. Right. Um, the documentation is being updated. We we have. I already have all the tables ready prepared, so you can see which platform gets ha translated how. And uh, that should show up in the next three four weeks in the documentation. Um, you wanted to ask something for ACL. Uh, the um, the question is how we map uh, users basically in Windows. We have a Windows client that interfaces with the ID the AD function 
uh, in Windows itself, right? It's it's not it's not uh, interfacing to the to the Unix backend. It's using the uh, Windows own uh, user and group interface. Um, we have built a new task engine into Lizard. We used to have a lot of a lot of complaints about uh, big jobs taking uh, basically nearly killing the the metadata server and we now introduced a, a task system that takes for now snapshotting and recursive remove operations and cuts them into small tasks and uh, in that way frees up the master server and prevents all this uh, all the locking scenarios the 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 task engine tries to first create as much a job as pos uh, as as large a job as possible to get rid of of as much of the of the job as you can and then then split the last in smaller tasks we have tested it and Basically, we got rid of this problem completely. I mean, we haven't seen it happening anymore. It it used to really be a big issue. Um, what I see in the next year is that we will try to move that to other features as well. Right? It's 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 not easy because the code base is quite big and and you have to rewrite every single client feature to, to be able to use the task engine, but for the two most complicated parts, which is snapshots, I mean, we had people that were waiting days for their snapshots removals to finish, <laughs> and uh, large recurs recursive removal operations, <laughs> that's completely gone. Um, we also added uh, functions where you can list running tasks and you could also stop them. So if you think that your job will impact your metadata server, you're now able to kill every task that's, that's running in the task engine. Um, yeah, we have, we have options. The, the two commands that use, that use the task, task engines are the uh, the commands for snapshots, make and uh, remove snapshots, and the recursive remove command. And they got also a new option where you can tell them how large the first job should be and if they should ignore any change that happens while the operation is running. I mean, they are both long-running operations, and if your snapshot doesn't ignore all changes that happen, then it probably doesn't make much sense. Um, so you can choose now if you want the, the snapshot operation to care for changes that happened while snapshotting or not. Okay. We another another feature that was added was read caching. We had some very primitive read caching till last year. Uh, and we noticed that it's not good enough to handle large sequential writes. Um, the reason why we never saw that before was that we didn't have so many customers using Lizard for massively large files. I mean, they're, they're, uh, Lizard is now used uh, especially in uh, genome <coughs> setups where the file sizes get like incredibly large and there you can see that uh, uh, there we have basically concrete numbers for how it behaves in sequential writes, uh, sequential reads, sorry. And uh, changing the read system to implement a more dynamic way of uh, the read caching brought us, I don't know, when we tested with Roger, I think it was eight to ten times improvement into the performance. Um, you can set, you can set within, uh, you can set within the mounts um, how large your re cache can grow. It will dynamically grow to that uh, window size. You can adjust that per mount. Uh, so if you don't have any sequential writes, you could uh, sequential reads. You can basically switch it off completely as well.
Okay, we started, I think in January last year, we started a new documentation project. Um, there's all of the installation, all of the self-compiling, and all administration commands are documented. Even some of the more complicated features are documented, like uh, geo distribution, like uh, setting up which chunk servers should be preferred for which clients. You can find all that, what is missing till now, and where we would be happy for any input if anybody wants to help. Um, are the pieces about daily work with LizardFS. Uh, there is only so much we can write as the developers and, and, uh, and the company that does support about your daily job. It would be far more interesting probably for users to get also uh, cookbook-like or FAQ-like entries from normal users. Right? Um, we are starting to document some of the more tricky management parts. And uh, one of the things I'm currently concentrating on is to create more documentation for developers that want to join the project. So last year, um, after a long time of testing, I think two years now, um, we implemented uh, Ganesha NFS as a, yeah, let's call it a translator from Lizard to NFS. It's implemented on, directly on the servers. So the, the Ganesha NFS server, metadata server is attached directly to our metadata server. And every chunk server you want to be, you want to take part in your NFS infrastructure, is basically linked to its own Ganesha data server as well, um, which enables us to fully support NFS 3, 4, 4.1, and PNFS. Um, we, we basically tried a lot of ways, starting with uh, direct translation, which is always horrible. Um, and for two years, we, we, we tried to even implement our own NFS and use different platform NFS systems, and basically all of them yeah, more or less failed. You couldn't do HA, you couldn't support any parallelization. And uh, with, with Ganesha, we basically managed to, to have a fully integrated setup that translates directly without all the, the mount operations or fuse translations or whatever we needed before when we had to translate mounts. Um, the, the implementation is relatively new. I think the release was in December. And as with the documentation, we are quite urgently looking for feedback and for testers to, to see how it behaves in different, in different scenarios. One limit with that, with that way of implementing NFS is that we only support it on Linux chunk servers. Right? Ganesha use, uh, seems to use a lot of Linux-specific functions, so for people that use, that use BSD or Mac or Solaris backends with, with Lizard FS, we can support uh, Ganesha there because there is no Ganesha on those platforms. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the Ganesha project was also the, the main force behind finishing our new client library, which allows you to talk directly to your LizardFS backend. And I will, I will talk about that later a bit more, but basically you, you now have a client library with which you can write in, yeah, probably in an hour, a client that replaces the mount command for LizardFS. So you could do all your file system transactions for any application you want. Yeah, no, no requirements for fuse, no requirements for any, for any mounts. It's, it's a direct client library to the LizardFS protocol.
Um, another one, another feature that, that we were asked for a lot because people, when they read that you can support massive uh, data structures, the first thing they start telling you is big data, um, was if we could uh, offer an HDFS support. And uh, we, we started working on that like one and a half years ago without really understanding how Hadoop works. <laughs> um, we are file system people. We are not really into uh, data language and data analysis. So the the first the first uh, implementation no the first incarnation let's call it of our HDFS uh, plugin was quite weird and uh, set on top of the of the mount system and basically translated every command uh, command back and forth and was totally unusable. Right. Um, um, then we we decided to to try the C API that comes with Hadoop. Um, after managing to implement that, we had to find out that most of the features we wanted for the Java people that work with Hadoop uh, are not implemented in the C API, and that most of our work made no sense whatsoever because we had a, an interface that was not usable. Um, and it, it seems to be very complex uh, to use it and create its overhead that was totally unnecessary because it was, again, Java to C, then from C, API, then again to us. Um, while working on that, uh, Piotrek invented a library that I already mentioned in the Ganesha project um, that allows you to talk directly to the lizard protocol. And uh, once we created a direct connector that basically uses the API to talk directly to the backends, we started to be able to create something that has enough performance that we can now call it a Hadoop plugin. Right? It's still in the works, and and uh, we haven't published it yet because it was not really in an alpha stage till last month. But you should find it in the next couple of weeks on GitHub and can take a look. And again, there we are looking for feedback because um, we don't really have a large Hadoop cluster. It's all done on minimal <laughs> stuff in our, uh, in our labs. And we don't really have any practical Hadoop experience. So we think it's feature complete. Um, but we would very much like some people that have Hadoop to give us feedback if we are right because it's mostly guesswork right now. Yeah. Um, what was interesting was that there, was a, there were a lot of problems with Hadoop itself, because uh, different things were differently implemented in different parts of Hadoop. So for example, we had uh, an interesting uh, experience that with the message file not found exception is not an insta instance of file not found exception because it's differently implemented in MapReduce and differently in Hadoop. And uh, Dev spent like weeks on finding where the bug is until we found out that it has nothing to do with us. It's on the layer up in Hadoop itself. So this was quite a, uh, an interesting experience of trying to, to, to link with a different project where you have actually not much uh, idea. So currently we have, a, uh, according to the HDFS tests, we have a feature complete HDFS on top of Lizard FS, speaking directly to the backends. Um, there is a small installation documentation already done. What we are adding now is how to use it. Um, it should show up in the next couple of weeks in GitHub. We are looking for help with with uh, quality checks for it because like i said we have a very very small hadoop cluster and there's only so much we can try there because we have no practical experience um so any feedback from the real world would be would be very appreciated so why we were working on ganesha and nfs um we created a, a library that we have published in December with a 3.12.0 release that you can use to write that you can use to write uh, native 
desired client. <coughs> right? There is, uh, it's available on all platforms that we support. Um, documentation is, is in the works. What is available now is, uh, is an example is an example file that shows you how to to import the, how to include it into your own projects. It's pretty easy to use. Um, it in, it includes features for logs, for writing, reading, unlinking, opening, and copying objects. Um, it allows you to get information about the state of each chunk server or all the chunk servers. So you could make use of the feature that checks for loads on different chunk servers, for example, and it, it allows you to manage ACLs. Um, the, the example file is, I think, 1K big, so it's, it's <coughs> pretty simple. And uh, if you have any, well, if you have any questions with that, the author is sitting here. So, <laughs> um, yes. So, so much about what we did uh, in the last twelve months. Um, I want to to give a little insight of what we have planned for the next year, or probably even longer. Um, we are uh, we are releasing today the the source code for our HA engine for the uh, metadata servers um, that used to be a commercial add-on from Sky Technologies. Um, we are releasing the Hadoop plugin, as I said, to the public um, because we think it's it's so that it's showable. <laughs> um, and we are starting to work on, a, on, on something we call Agama, which is the next generation of Lizard, um, which has a lot of internal changes. I have some more to say about that in about two minutes. Um, we have extended our, our testing to the Windows subsystem for Linux. We found out that we can really put a whole, that we can translate all of LizardFS to it. The only thing you can't do on the Windows subsystem is work with signals, because there are no. Um, it's pretty interesting as the next testing platform. So um, the, the, the new LizardFS um, has a whole different internal architecture that's mostly focused on performance. We think everything in the normal features is stable, and we are now moving to, to get Lizard to a different performance level. Um, we want to start with a completely new client, um, and then move the changes that we put into the client also into the metadata and the chunk servers. Um, the client, the client will be um, totally backwards compatible. So basically, you can start working with the client and then, then upscale the rest as well. Um, the, the changes are th that we have planned is we are moving from the single monolithic setup how we have it now to an event-driven architecture. Um, we are switching to async I/O. Um, utilizing the, the Think Async library because we think it's the easiest way to stay current also with the C++ standards. Um, we are trying to get rid of, get rid of uh, a lot of pieces that use in kernel features, especially um, looking at the, the bugs that are that, that show up all the time in the, in the kernel space, we would like to get out of there as much as possible. Um, so all our network features are, for example, now 100% in user space. Um, we are adding a new tracing subsystem to, the, to, the <laughs> to all the modules, because for now you just get you get massive log output from the chunk servers, from the metadata servers, 
from the loggers, from the clients, and there's, it's relatively hard to correlate which, which piece is uh, related to which function on which, uh, on which component. So now there are 64-bit uh, identifiers on every transaction that is being logged, so you can uh, see and trace in your distributed system where your things go and why and when. Um, there is a new there is a new monitoring feature being introduced that will allow us to automatically adjust timeouts, to automatically adjust settings because we had a lot of situations where customers don't use the easy set like we tell them but go into relatively complicated uh, parts and just fiddle around and then come back and ask for support with the fiddled setup. Yes? The source. Yeah. What's the source for the transaction no. identifiers? Who those um, I don't know. <laughs> so um, I have our uh, the the developer who wrote that here. We can answer the question afterwards. I get him here to answer your question. Okay. Um, so we we added a new uh, no. We are adding a new monitoring system that is basically set, like I said, to automate all the settings where people were telling, to, uh, telling us that they are crypting, crypted but understandable and, and create a lot of support overhead because people just set them and then uh, call and write and say, it's not working, we haven't changed anything besides this 70 settings. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, stuff that is relatively relatively fixed now and work has started on it is the client. Um, we have eliminated most of the kernel caches. Um, we have started on implementing the client so that it uses a user space network subsystem. Right. Um, there is now full write versioning in the works. Uh, till now, the system was doing partial write versioning. Um, we found, uh, we, we, we saw that this leads to relatively slow writes because uh, only one chunk server at a time can write uh, to the backend. If you have full write versioning, basically every chunk server that wants to write into that place can do that and the newest version basically wins. Um, that allows to, to improve the I.O. by a factor of up to 100. Um, it also safeguards you against some edge cases in erasure coding where basically parity could be written twice um, and destroy your stripe set. Um, it also uh, helps you against some very rare edge cases where microseconds of differences uh, occur in writing to different metadata servers. <laughs> if you have full write versioning, the synchronization is much safer and basically uh, easier to handle. Um, yeah, and as I said, the, the writes become much faster now. I mean, in tests we were able to, set, to saturate a 40G interface now yeah. with one client. So, the, the things for the chunk servers and the metadata servers are basically Plans. I mean, currently we are working on the client, and the idea is to move all that that we find in the client to the to the backend servers as well. And the plans for the chunk servers are relatively easy. I mean, we will take the same AIO work for for event-driven architecture and asynchronous uh, I/O, take the user space network functions, and move them to the chunk servers as well. And there is a lot of work planned to get rid of old complicated uh, structures and simplify the whole thing. Um, reason is one of the main drivers of the project is simplicity. I don't know how many of you have used LizardFS, but, uh, but normally a setup takes 
I don't know, I can set up uh, very basically ZFS in about 20 minutes. Right, complete, with prepared for simple erasure coding even. So we want to make that even simpler and automate as much as possible and get rid of uh, a lot of stuff that we still find too complicated. Um, same is planned for the new metadata server. The metadata server additionally will have this, uh, this monitoring feature I, I said something about before that will allow you to, to move a lot of the more complex settings to be automated. Um, so timeouts, backend drive handling, interactions with the backend file system, uh, read ahead cache settings and so on will be automatically, will, will be possible to be set automatically by the metadata server on the chunk servers and even on the clients. Um, the, the, the other feature we want to introduce that was asked a lot is a distributed network of metadata servers. Um, we are currently experimenting with uh, different key value stores to be able to, to create a network of active metadata servers. Um, but that's all more at the planning stage than, than, uh, than anything else because concentration currently is on the clients. So also the, the, the right versioning that we are currently implementing in the client will take its way to the metadata servers as well. So we are, we are today um, open sourcing the, the HA backend that we, were, that we have deliver, uh, developed for the ZFS, it's called UREFT. It's, we are using it since four years, successfully at all our commercial customers. It's based on the REFT algorithm. It, it is a, a quorum-based backend that uh, switches IP. Um, it requires at least two nodes plus a quorum node or three nodes. Um, the settings are really, really easy. I will show an example. Um, the switchover times that we have are in the sub-second range. And you can use it, now you can use it probably for whatever you want, but our scripts are, that we will publish are for our metadata servers and for the Ganesha meta servers as well. Yeah. Um, it uses a floating IP model. The, the, it has a very fast election process. You can see the, the theory behind it on the raft algorithm uh, definition page, which basically has a very nice graph about how the election process works. Um, the, the resources it uses are absolutely minimal. Very often we put the quorum node at the, on the same box as the chunk server and you don't even notice that there is a change in, in resources on the box. So this is an example of a UREFT configuration. Um, you start with describing which node has which address. Um, you add the floating IP and the floating netmask net and the interface that you want your IPs being switched on. And the only difference between your nodes is in the UREFT ID, right? The configuration is the same on each node. You just give it, give each node a different ID, and that's your whole setup. So it's really, really simple. Yeah, and my time is up. <laughs> Um, yes, time is unfortunately over. Um, if you have more questions to LizardFS, uh, visit the booth in Building K. Um, yes, <coughs> thank you. Thank you.